Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending this webinar today. Uh, the time has come uh, to start uh, the uh, NOMRA SRI uh, uh, Innovation Center uh, uh, Global uh, Transformation uh, innovation uh, challenges and opportunities for Japanese companies webinar will be held. Uh, my name is uh, Iwasaki of the Future Innovation Strategy Department of uh, Nomura Holdings. Uh, today, uh, we will have simultaneous interpretation. If you wish to use uh, simultaneous uh, interpretation, please uh, refer to the uh, interpretation button uh, below uh, the screen on the PC. There will be a survey after the uh, webinar. Uh, we would like to ask for your cooperation during the survey as well. Now, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Masahiro Goto, oh, Senior Managing Director of Nomura Securities for the European Remarks. My name is Goto from Nomura Securities. Thank you very much for participating in the first joint seminar between SRI and Nomura. I despise your very busy schedules. Now, today, we have about 180 customers who are registered. In September of last year, we partnered with SRI with the aim of assisting Japanese customers in introducing next generation technology and innovation to Silicon Valley. And we announced the establishment of NOMA SRI Innovation Center. On July 7th, this will be officially opened and that is why we are holding such a webinar here today. As you may be aware, recently in Silicon Valley in the United States, an increasing number of large Japanese companies have developed in banks and CVCs and innovation information antenna hubs. Through direct investment in startups, LP investment in funds, and participation in local ecosystems, they are involved in the acquisition and use of state-of-the-art science and technology. In a global competitive environment, regardless of sector, development of new services and products through the use of cutting-edge deep tech, as well as strategies such as replacing existing assets to enter into new businesses are becoming increasingly important. In addition, there is a need to resolve common issues faced by corporations, such as enhancing their security levels and raising efficiency. And the tide of ESG and SDGs are becoming huge waves throughout the world. Japanese companies are accelerating their initiatives in order to adapt to these changes. Here at Innovation Center, we hope to be able to support these by proposing novel business ideas and exploring state-of-the-art technology. On the other hand, the change in the environment due to COVID-19 pandemic has also greatly impacted the activities of innovative activities by Japanese companies. Today's topic is inclusive of these changes from a mid to long-term perspective of how innovation can be brought about. This will be presented by SRI President Manish and Chris, head of the Innovation Center. SRI is equipped with state-of-the-art technology, including robotics, quantum technology, space, AI, machine learning, cybersecurity, considering the world's top class deep tech access to uh, outstanding startups and high quality ecosystem in, in Silicon Valley and wide ranging experience spanning 70 years in innovation. Innovation Center we believe we can provide these SRI strengths through programs that can be fully utilized by Japanese companies in order to help customers resolve their issues. So, for SRI, by partnering with Nomura, this is something that we'll be able to realize for the first time. And innovation related knowledge we have, which we have not disclosed to the public, can also be provided. And also at this center, 
it will be possible to leverage uh, this to cultivate next generation innovators. We hope there will be active networking among member companies. Mata, member Kigo Doshi no Kapatsna, Yokono Renke Mo, Kitai Kitai to no Kaksa. We also hope to be able to support these HR development as well. So we will be operating the center so that、uh, we will be able to respond to these needs by customers. In Nomura Investment Banking Services, we have been supporting value enhancement and growth of our client companies throughout the world. Through the newly established Innovation Center, And by collaborating with SRI, we hope to continue to actively, actively、uh, further support our Japanese client customers. Through such endeavors, we hope to continue to help our customers in their main line of business and to grow together. Thank you very much.、And、that is all for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Next, I'd like to call upon、uh, Managing Director A. g i d e l Yusuf、uh, of the Japan Office of SRI International for his opening remarks. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. My name is Iridel、uh, Head of SRI, Japan, SRI International Japan.、Uh, thank you very much、uh, for gathering today despite your very busy schedule. And also, I'm、uh, holding this event. I would like to also thank n o m u r a Securities for their cooperation. Thank you very much. SRI International、uh, started in 1946 from Stanford University. We are a research and development organization.、Uh, during the past 75 years, SRI has、uh, provided the first internet protocol, ARPA net, and first computer mouse. The first autonomous type of、uh, moving robot, first personal assistant Siri in your iPhones right now, and the first robot、uh, surgery system, Da Vinci, and the first AR application. So, we have carried out research and development on various technical innovations that have impacted the world. In SRI Japan,、uh, Has been established 58 year, years ago, and we have been、uh, supporting and helping the business expansion and innovation of Japanese customers. So, we are very happy that、uh, through such opportunities, we will be able、uh, to introduce SRI technology as, also,、uh, as well as our innovation. In o m u r a Group, our collaboration with them is not the first time. In the early part of the 1960s, n a m u r a Securities, based on our SRI model, established the NRI, n a m u r a Research Institute, as the first Japanese private think tank. At that time, in order to provide support from SRI, the very first Japanese office of SRI. Was located in the Nomura Securities Building. Today, in the SRI main campus, which is located、uh, in the center of Silicon Valley, that is where our headquarters are, we would like to introduce the Nomura SRI Innovation Center, which will start full fledged operations from next month, as well as SRI Innovation. Uh, SR President Manish Kautari will report, and also from、um, uh, Chris Kort, at the head of the Nomura SRI Innovation Center, there will be a presentation as well. But、uh, before that, we would like to show you a short video of voices of SRI customers in Japan. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Please、uh, view the video.
サーライさんのドアをノックしたのはですね、当社の抱えている技術陣、えー、発想力には限界があり、全く新しい発明を求めていたからでありまして、エースアライさんの技術陣の皆さんとワークショップを通じていろいろなディスカッションをしたり、一作品を作ったりする過程で、とにかく大変な頭脳がエースアライさん側にあるということも分かり、我々も大変な刺激を受けて、心から期待を寄せてチャレンジをする、そういうふうにちょっと会社の文化が変わったと。というところが一番の成果だと思います。サーライさんがですね、非常にあの高い技術が売りであるというところがまあモットーだったというふうに、僕らは一番初めそう思ってたんですけどもね、アイデーションとかまあそういう形で我々が必要としているものをちゃんと理解してくださって、それに対するソリューションを提供してくれるというところがございまして、まあそういうところが非常に学びであったというところもありますし、まあこれからもですね、あのそういうところを。一緒にやってきたらいいのかなというふうに思っております。我々はこの開発の中で無謀とも思えるような要求をたくさん出させていただきました。ですが、それによって非常に高いレベルのソリューションの実現が可能になるというふうに思っています。それは非常に協力的な対応を常にしていただいているというふうに考えています。非営利団体ということもあり、その他の米国企業と比較しても。信頼を重視した組織文化を持つ稀有な存在だというふうに見ております。まあ一日系企業かつまあ伝統的な企業風土を持つ大橋組としては非常に信頼できるパートナーであり、えー、定量的な指標では表せない価値があるというふうに考えています。今は新型コロナの影響で人々の生活のあり方が大きく変化しようとしています。我々の業界もより一層無人化、遠隔化のニーズが高まると予想しています。このような社会環境の変化にいかに早く対応できるか、いかに適応力を高められるかということで、我々は SRI さんとの共同ということに大いに期待しております。SRI さんと連携することで、世界が本当に欲しがっている真の ESG 課題解決に向けて、守りのイノベーションではなく、攻めのイノベーションを実施できるチャンスだというふうに考えています。どうもありがとうございました。Thank you very much. それでは、視聴講演。Uh, like uh, 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 What I hope to do today is really talk a little bit about where we are in this time and place. We have had a very interesting 18 months, a very difficult 18 months, and we're in a time and place where we need to really think about the future, including ESG and other elements. Quick, I think Igedar san has given a background about SRI, so I won't take too much time, but needless to say, We are a nonprofit. Our goal is to make world changing solutions, to make the world people safer, healthier, and more productive. We've done it in many ways, as, as Igidar san mentioned, so, which I will not repeat here. But a little more detail.、Uh, so, we, our primary source of、uh, research money comes from DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Programs in the US, which really does very cutting edge work. Looking five to seven years in the future. So,、uh, we have thousands of patents. We do a lot of RD projects. Most of our researchers have advanced degrees. We have also done a lot of spin off companies, 70. I know Intuitive Surgical, Da Vinci Robot,、um, uh, recently Nuance, which just sold to、uh, uh, Microsoft, was from us, Siri, and a large number of others with many good successes. So, this is our background. And we are very technology focused, and we are really focused on transition to advanced technology into the marketplace. So, let me step back and just talk about why now is now a good time for innovation. We are having some very big changes that all of us are aware of. We have $7 billion people now, we will have 10 billion people by 2050. We have to think about how this changes the world. What, how do we deliver food? How do we sustain our environment? How 
do we make things so that diseases don't spread everywhere so quickly, so fast? Uh, these are all real challenges. We know climate change is really threatening, not just a way of doing business like in agriculture, but threatening our very security. It is threatening communities. It is causing upheavals in many parts of the world that we all do business with, our companies do business with. So for all of these reasons, climate change is a big driver of how we need to think. Um, raw materials that we use forever in our systems may not be available tomorrow or may have difficulty being used without threatening the environment. So all of this is spurring innovation. We know life expectancy continues to go up and up and up, which means the population demographics are starting to change in a very considerable way. We have fewer workers. I mean, Japan has been going through this for some time already, but the rest of the world is not far behind. In the past, we were able to transition transfer our labor needs from our own countries to other countries. As you can see on that graph, by 2020, that is going away. That is going to become increasingly difficult to do. Even in countries like India, where the population is increasing, the, the truth is in all but three states in India or four states in India, the population is also decreasing there too. So there is in all places, challenges with fewer workers that we have to consider. We also have, of course, the last 18, 24 months with, with sheer impact of global pandemics. There's a broader concept here, which is on one hand, it has really been difficult and traumatic for the world. On the other hand, the sheer scale of innovation to come from zero to a vaccine within five to six months of, of from or eight months from starting is something that is unprecedented and it reflects the tremendous advances that have been made in biotech as well as in advanced computer sciences, which were helping the biotech world. And finally, of course, we have slowly but surely creating more and more digital twins and more and more complicated and complex digital twins of what we do. Once we can convert something that's a physical system into a simulation and we can do it accurately, the door opens up for many things. So in many ways, this is a critical time in history to make a major impact from innovation. The technologies are there to make a major impact. The need is there to make a major impact. And the businesses that do not will be the dinosaurs of the past and not the mammals of the future. So this is a time to do it. It is a very exciting time. There is so much innovation happening in so many different areas. People often ask me, is innovation moving faster than before or do we just think it's moving faster than before? There are many indicators that show innovation is moving at a pace unlike ever before. The number of approved patents has increased by an order of magnitude over the last 50 years. The number of papers that are cited by others and show high ratings has increased by a order of magnitude over the last years. The growth, sheer growth in market capitalization has increased by an order of magnitude. So everything, the R&D budgets have increased by an order of magnitude. So for all these reasons, we know that there is tremendous innovation taking place and it's taking place everywhere. It's taking place in the internet of things. It is taking place in quantum technology. It's taking place in synthetic biology, digital manufacturing, in energy and environment, autonomy, and in so many different areas and human augmentation. I will just show a few here for reference. Um, so let's just take space as an example. So we know that for the longest time we have had satellites operating high up in the atmosphere. Over the last 10 years, led by SpaceX and Planet Labs, there's been a revolution. A satellite now can be built for $10,000, which could not be done even three years ago. They can be kept at low Earth orbit, and you can put a swarm of these satellites to provide redundant internet services, redundant GPS services, GPS services with even more accuracy 
than you can provide, uh, than you can currently have. So you can build true autonomy of vehicles. This is happening. This comes at a cost and a challenge. I mean, this, for example, is an image of all the junk in space, all the little pieces of particles that are out there. These are 10 centimeters and above. What you're seeing here is just the satellites from one particular constellation, SpaceX, that was out there. By the way, this was taken a year ago today, or 2019, as you can see, a year and a half ago, two years ago. Today, SpaceX has 10 times the number of satellites that it has in this picture. That just highlights to you the revolution that's happening in space and the changes one are likely to see about how we receive our internet, how we manage our autonomous vehicles like tractors or excavation facilities. There's, of course, we've all heard about the revolution in, in, um, in AI, but we really, in many ways, the current generation of AI, which is the second wave, is really good at learning and perceiving, but it cannot reason or generalize or have good context. Why is this important here, but not important there? The new systems we are seeing coming out are excellent at perceiving, learning, and reasoning. They're getting some ability to even generalize. So when you went from deep blue on the left being able to beat um, Gary Kasparov in chess to a math go in the 2020s, 10s, beating, beating the master in, in, in go, we are about to hit a brand new concept of where AI can go. This is going to actually enable us to do things much, much greater than we can do today. When you combine that with quantum computing, which is still probably five to 10 years off, the combination of those two will fundamentally change how medicinal chemistry and other things are taken care of. Speaking of chemistry, we all heard about CRISPR and Cas9. It's, a, it's an amazing technology for those who haven't. CRISPR and a Cas9 is, is one of the biggest breakthroughs of this century. It enables us to edit our genes. People have done it for all sorts of things, like all the way in, in the case of some cases, like to try and edit uh, babies, which I, is a completely unethical approach, but it's been done. Uh, there have been others which have caused brand new diseases to be, cures for diseases to be identified. In sickle cell, CRISPR is being routinely used to help cure a disease that was uncurable. But even more interesting is in the last two months, just to show you how fast this is moving, from 2015 when CRISPR started getting attention to today, we now have ways one of the challenges with CRISPR was how do you edit your genes if you're already a grown adult? Do you have to do a bone marrow transplant? How does it get into the system? Just this year, a few months ago, it was shown that we don't have to do that. We can change the environment around the gene. And just by changing the environment around the gene, which is a technique called CRISPR on or CRISPR off, we can actually change how that gene exhibits itself. We've all known that the environment has changes how our genes function and apply themselves, but now we can do this. So we can do this for Alzheimer's. We can do this for other areas. We can turn off the genes that cause the plaques to be formed in the brain. This is fresh. This is just three months old, but this just tells you the break breakneck rate of innovation that is happening in multiple areas. When you're gonna combine this with advanced AI, you will pretty soon see the ability to start editing G, uh, the gene environment we live in to get rid of things like chronic diseases. This could happen within 10 years. So it's unbelievable what the amount of innovation happening. A lot of it is having at research labs, but then the question is why the failure rate of technology innovation so high when we have such great assets available to us, why is it that the failure rate is still so high? Why is it that the folks who run corporations trying to bring in new products see it difficult to adopt? And I think I'd like to highlight here three or four different ways in which failures occur in technology innovation. There are others, but these are the four I think that are worth thinking of. 
One, I'm sure almost everybody has seen this. This is called a hype cycle, which talks about at what phase in time is the technology on the bottom? Is it early in the innovation process? And how high are the expectations of the technology on the y-axis? At the beginning on the left, and this was taken from a couple of years ago, you have things like fly, uh, flying autonomous vehicle. It is early in the innovation cycle. The expectations are not very high. Often they go high. As you go up and up and up, you go towards deep neural nets right at the top. It's at the peak of what we people think we can do in 2019, 2020. You can see some things that have already fallen, like mixed reality, autonomous driving. People started worrying. They started going to what is called the trough of disillusionment, where you're disillusioned. Here's one of the challenges. Everybody is afraid of missing out. So very early in the technology development phase, where it's still early in its maturity cycle, which you can see highlighted there in the blue, uh, in the yellow, one invests. One invests a lot of money into this. Uh, but the technology does not meet the expectations or does not meet the market requirements. That happens very early. One of the things SRI does by working with DARPA is we're often working with a lot of technology at that earliest stage. So we have a very good sense of what technology can or cannot do. We have a very realistic or techno-realistic approach to what technology can or cannot do, as opposed to an inflated expectation of what it can or cannot do. Sometimes there's a risk on the opposite side. If you come in very early and invest a lot of money, you will find technology becomes superseded. A perfect example of this was with artificial intelligence. Between 2016 and 2018, so many startups were created to create the processes for artificial intelligence. Then Google releases Kubernetes, a platform and a associated technology, a platform that enabled that and TensorFlow, a platform in which the vast majority of the systems that do AI is now residing on. And suddenly all these startups and all these efforts have gone to waste. So sometimes you come in too early, the technology doesn't live up to its expectations. Sometimes you come in too early, invest a lot of money, and you find that the technology is going to be superseded by something superior and more usable very soon. If you come in too late, you have the other problem. You might find that your patents and the technology is all locked up either by, in the worst case, by your competitors, but in some cases by others. And then getting in becomes very difficult. How do you find your own way? So coming in too late has its challenges as well. And finally, it's very important to think of, if you think of technology as IP or intellectual property, you also have to think of the people who know how to use it, which is IQ or your intelligence. Often one acquires a technology that one does not have internally built skill sets to handle, to absorb. And so what happens is you get this technology and it holds great promise, but it does not deliver on the promise. I will give one example here. As an engineer, when a very smart engineer does something, they try to do 18 or 19, 20 things that don't work before they find the one thing that works. If that technology is then transferred over to somebody else without, with just IP or intellectual property transfer, but no IQ or intelligence transfer, guess what the smart engineer at the person acquiring you does? they repeat the same 19 or 20 things that the smart engineer somewhere else did. You end up failing. So we have a lot of challenges and I just have highlighted a few of these challenges that are applicable. At SRI, we've had 75 years of experiencing this. We've had a great fortune and opportunity to partner with Nomura, uh, to create the Nomura SRI Innovation Center. And what we're looking to do here is really help our, our, our members really understand these nuances, help when they're coming in too early and the technology is not going to meet their expectations, or it's likely to get superseded by something that's coming right around the corner, which SRI is very familiar with, or that, that it's not going to, it's, you're coming in too late 
And you're gonna to have to find an alternative way to solve the same problem. And finally, to make sure that your researchers and engineers can explore how to use that technology in a friendly, safe environment in Silicon Valley before you necessarily acquire or absorb it into your company. So our hope with this is that those failure rates of technology innovation integration decrease and ultimately afford you the chance to really have a successful growth in the business through deep technology. Uh, with that, I'd like to end my presentation and I'd really like to uh, thank you for attending this webinar and uh, happy to take any questions or comments offline or otherwise. Thank you. Back to you, Iwasaki-san. Thank you for, for your introduction. Um, we're very excited to be working uh, to build this innovation center in partnership with Nomura and, and SRI. Uh, we call it uh, NSIC for short. In this presentation, we will share uh, the vision, some representative content, and some of the principles of how the activities will support our, uh, the members' aspirations. In this executive summary, uh, one of the key things is how this is built on four pillars, a mutual trusting relationship, a deep technology focus, access to the SRI network, and a proven innovation toolkit. Our intent is to enhance the open innovation in Silicon Valley for our Japanese member organizations. Manish posed this question as well. I'll, I'll reframe this. And so why now? Uh, well, I would say, why not now? Uh, COVID has unmasked many weaknesses and allowed us to examine our customer behaviors and reinvent our businesses going forward. We strongly believe that innovators over the next 10 years will use this moment to decide if they're going to reinvent their business approaches or simply react and return to normal. Over the past 75 years, SRI technology invention has made some prof profound impact on our daily lives and the link with Japan has been a central relationship over the past 50 years. Japan's an important business market and financial hub and global businesses really must have relationships and, a, and an explicit strategy. NSIC aims to serve as a spark for the members' innovation efforts. Innovation is a contact sport, uh, having been in this game for 25, uh, almost 30 years. I have a bunch of scars for, from, those, uh, from that contact sport, but it is a team effort, uh, uh, most of all, and NSIC will aim to be the player coach whose role it is to find the path of least resistance and steer around the predictable potholes. So while you're keeping your eyes on the road, it's helpful to have partners and teams of advisors who can provide navigation on the sometimes foggy road towards innovation. And our team has decades of experience in doing just this. NSIC is designed to enhance Japanese corporate innovation in Silicon Valley. It's a member-centric program and the goals are fourfold, to identify advanced technologies, build and curate technology-driven portfolios by connecting our members with the right types of partners for, and for developing the, and commercializing the technology, and provide a hands-on experience to further develop their teams and talent with an innovative mindset. So what do we mean by the Silicon Valley open innovation ecosystem? Uh, Silicon Valley is not the only place where innovation occurs. We, kn we know that. Uh, however, it is a unique place to have all of these elements in the ecosystem present in one place and at one time. And so together with Nomura, we will offer a platform and access to talented people, unique technology and business insights, top tier investors, and clusters of diverse companies which are commercializing world-changing innovations. 
We're very excited that we uh, broke ground last year and uh, we have this dynamic Menlo Park workspace, which will be complete in July uh, of uh, 2021. The ENSIC environment is purpose-built for members to get the most out of their experience. And to match open innovation mission, ENSIC will be the front porch of the more secure SRI research labs. And so we're able to fluidly invite members and guests inside for events. There are so many global opportunities, some that Manish highlighted that are, that I, uh, some of which I'm particularly passionate around. And the great uh, opportunity here is to, um, for each year, NSIC to curate a set of global opportunities to match with the members' interests and SRI visions for the future. So here are just a few that we are projecting that we will focus on in the next 12 months with the, um, with the initial sets of member organizations. FinTech, Advanced and Future of Manufacturing, Health and Wellness, future of cities, climate, food, and quantum. So in order to match some of those, there are some foundational deep tech uh, content, um, which we think of as these base technologies. And there's so many fa fascinating technology domains. And again, NSIC will curate a diverse set of relevant um, for the members to address their needs. So here's just a sample of topics we're planning to present over the next 12 to 18 months. Internet of Things, edge computing, AI, ML, blockchain, advanced robotics, advanced manufacturing, AR, VR, and extended reality, as well as quantum sensors. SRI is, is really adept at strategically combining the deep technology research and applying and converting that into novel technologies that are uh, um, able to be commercialized. A unique competency of SRI is to artfully combine base technologies into supporting technologies which are able to be converted into the commercial domain. So for example, if we are focusing on a big opportunity like Future of Cities, these are um, a set of, of, of technologies that combine into these um, uh, supporting technologies. So if we're working on Future of Cities, we actually need to work on smart transportation, nimble data and microgrids, which are built on the backs of these combinations of edge computing, blockchain, robotics, AI and ML. So it's, a, it's really key not to just understand the base technologies, but understand these supporting um, platforms in, in which to, to build products and services um, for, for, for those global opportunities. So how does NSIC provide differentiated value to its members? We don't have a one step, one, two, three step process for guaranteed success and, and Manish highlighted, even if we did, there's the success, uh, the failure rate is, is, has been high in these. And so using the, knowing that we have a robust set of behavioral principles that, and innovation principles that will guide us in order to support a broad and complementary set of member business sectors. The first one is being inspired by deep technology. Our, te our teams are excited about the inherent potential impact of emerging technologies, and we think expansively and are, and are problem driven. So if you take the time to immerse yourself in technology, then you're, you're well equipped to identify patterns and opportunities for technology arbitrage, but as well think about how to serve or even create bigger markets. Manish also mentioned a couple of times around timing. So timing is everything. And we believe that aligning the innovation stars is critical. So those are, are usually technology readiness, market opportunity, the ecosystem development. And if you can see the connections, then you're able to design your effective plan of attack. So we've all been there too early or too late with an excellent idea, or even right on time without the right commercial partner. And time is such a precious resource and innovation management is, is critical to use it wisely, which may mean cutting projects earlier than anticipated to realize the true strategic vision. So 
Timing is one of those things. If you can take a portfolio view of innovation, it helps manage risk and also um, know when to say yes, and also more importantly, when to say no. Envisioning your uh, a future is a powerful uh, innovation tool. So if you're able to create a vision of, uh, of, of your desired future state, um, and then even tell your story uh, as if you were a science fiction writer to your audience, they, they are able to defer judgment just long enough to understand your vision. So I'll give you an example. This sketch that you see here was made by a General Motors designer in the 1930s showing two major innovations of the time, highways and self-driving cars. So in the 1930s and beyond, in the US, highways shaped our lives and economies for decades, but yet it was 70 years before Google was able to launch the self-driving uh, prototype. So sometimes the, these visions can take a long time to, to come to fruition, but the, the visions themselves can be powerful organizational tools and not just uh, the, the territory of science fiction writers. So visions are nice, uh, but what I, I, I usually say to my teams, what are you going to build on Monday? That, that it's, it's nice to be able to envision that future, but using a tool, uh, what we call retrocasting, is working backwards to that from the vision to that first pilot, that first key investment, um, that first hire, all of the, or even a first partnership, all of those kinds of things uh, are, are, are really about setting, setting the plan to achieve that vision. And, and often the first step is defining the right questions to, to ask. So with, uh, with a, that set of questions, you're, you're able to go through the process of strategic planning of pilots and experiments and new initiatives that fuel progress and play an important role in de-risking the vision of the future. So if you're able to um, start a prototype with that aims at that vision, you're able to learn from that prototype and course correct along the way, but still have an eye on that, on that long-term vision. Inspiring new ideas. Uh, as a designer for almost 30 years, people think it's a blue sky exercise, but creativity does need constraints. And innovation requires this intentional cycle of diverging um, to discover new technology applications and business opportunities. You need to absorb as much inspiration as possible. And so you, you need to use an initially diverging phase um, in order to pull in as much, as much breadth of ideas before converging to your first prototype. It may feel uncomfortable at first, but knowing that you're the, the, the process drives you to converging does shape the process um, and it does work. So speaking of uh, process and best practices, SRI considers itself uh, technology pr uh, pragmatic um, and as well with innovation. There's no dominant process which must be followed. However, there are a, a, a we have a big set and ever expanding tools, tool set of processes that help us along the way. And we believe it's, it's, uh, it's important to leverage the most relevant innovation behaviors and processes for your context, business context, and your team. So NSIC will certainly leverage the best of uh, design thinking, technology forecasting, experimentation like lean or agile, um, and use all of those processes to, to help along the way. So startups have and will continue to grab headlines from Silicon Valley about funding, growth, and even liquidity exits. But we use them in this context to, um, as a lens and a lens to learn. So what can we learn from startups and how they build their teams, how they commercialize technology? And, and it's a robust way to fuel corporate innovation and entrepreneurship. So whether you intend to partner or, or invest in a startup or simply want to look how they behave and how they would aim to address a market that you're thinking about, these are critical interactions and a, and a set of, of relationships to, to cultivate. So here's a dashboard of the uh, 
um, of the program, and it's specifically designed for the Japanese corporate members in mind. It's not executive education, nor is it an incubator. And we broke it into these four manageable tracks. First is the technology track, which, uh, which would be um, the experience would be exploring and evaluating and applying uh, SRI technology and content to emerging opportunity areas. The innovation process track is to gain fluency with innovation tools and, and the mindset to address these fast moving challenges. The startup track, as I just described, is really about uh, connecting and evaluating and even working side by side with your favorite relevant startups. Immersion is, is critical in Silicon Valley about how to navigate uh, and, and deepen relationships for future partnerships. So each of the tracks serve a purpose and members can participate in as much of their time or energy allows. And a critical thing that we wanted to, um, to balance is the learning by uh, learning together, by experiencing projects together, so across member organizations. But we also know that, uh, that teams are tasked with specific goals. And so we've, we've created um, member select areas of the program where as much as 40% of the program is customized to the individual member needs. We will be uh, kicking off uh, very soon in a soft launch in July and very excited to be working together in person. And in fact, um, we're timing the, uh, uh, the big kickoff event where, where most, uh, most of the teams will be able to gather uh, in, in person in October. But in the meantime, we'll be onboarding and um, starting with early content and then October through December, all the way through the fall, um, new members will be joining and we'll having, be having um, program activities throughout that time period and targeting a executive summit in, um, in Japan in December. So to wrap up, NSIC uh, at SRI is, is really about inventing a better future together. And that's a platform where we, we invite as many members as possible in order to engage in, in that. Um, members should expect to, to see and feel uh, a shift through this program time. And while mindsets take a little bit of time to change, there are some tangible outcomes that, uh, that people and teams should expect. So organizations should see this through, for example, a regularly updated um, technology roadmap and insider perspective of Silicon Valley, employee training on in innovation best practices, priority access to new technology and deals, and a tailored hands-on experience. So we invite you to reach out and learn more. And if you're traveling to Silicon Valley, please come for a visit. And with that, I will turn it back to, to the team. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. With this, uh, I would like to bring uh, this uh, webinar to a close. Uh, after the webinar is completed, uh, uh, the survey screen will uh, come up. Uh, I we would like to ask for your cooperation in filling the questionnaire. As Manish has mentioned uh, in his uh, presentation, his we will be very happy to receive any questions uh, offline as well. Uh, at the end of the survey, uh, there is an uh, area where you can write your question. And at a later date, uh, please feel free to uh, fill in the questionnaire that will be sent to you. Thank you very much for your cooperation as well as your participation uh, for the webinar today. Thank you very much.